Now you can think of this section as the heart and soul of your entire A-level economics. Because in this section, we are now going to build a very detailed and a step-by-step -step understanding of the model of demand and supply, which is basically a theoretical way of showing this model of demand and supply. It tells us in a theoretical way, how is the price and equilibrium quantity of each individual product determined? And while expressing the whole process of how the price and quantity of every product is determined, this model of demand and supply, remember, turns out to be a tool that economists use to showcase the whole beauty of the free market economic theory. They express this whole beautiful idea that, look, in a free market, remember from the last section, the government doesn't need to do anything, and the price of every product, it will adjust to automatically give you a nice equilibrium where there is no shortage and no surplus. That is the sort of thing that this model of demand and supply explains looking at the market of one individual product. So it's a micro-level product. We'll consider the market of any imaginary single product. Now this model itself, it's, it's really simple. It's a very easy model based on some very simple logical uh, ideas. All you need is you need to just understand it once and for all. And I'll make sure you do that, you understand all the key concepts by the end of this video. But before I start, the only complication that may arise and I want to highlight at the very beginning, and we'll get rid of that complication by the end of this video, that relates uh, to the fact that you need to remember and be aware uh, that this model of demand and supply, it uses some very specific terminology. And some of the terms, they are very similar and the meaning is also very similar. So you just need to make sure that you understand the subtle differences and you understand exactly what each of the different terms they mean. Now with that in mind, let me just you know start off by building up an imaginary scenario over here where we are going to assume that there is a market of ice cream. And through this imaginary market of ice cream, I'm just going to use some simple logic to build some simple numbers. And through that, I'll explain to you uh, all the ideas that you need to know. So market, first of all, remember the way we define the market of a product is that a market is any place where you have consumers and producers of a product coming together face to face. Now that is the sort of definition that can earn you a couple of marks if you put it in a relevant essay question, a market, a place where consumers and producers of a product come together. Now, of course, these producers, they will decide how many ice creams they want to produce and these consumers, they will decide how many ice creams they want to buy. And let me first of all zoom in and focus on the consumer side and develop all the details and then uh, we will move on to the supply side. Now as far as these consumers are concerned, we are saying they will have to decide of course how many ice creams they want to buy. And their decision will depend on a lot of factors. So for instance weather. If weather gets un unusually hot, then perhaps these consumers will want to buy more ice creams whereas if the weather is unusually cold, they may wish to buy fewer ice creams. Similarly, the incomes of the people where this market happens to be, that will also determine how many ice creams they are going to buy. So if there is a recession, let's say, and people start losing their jobs and therefore their incomes, maybe they will wish to buy fewer ice creams. And we can come up with a lot of other uh, factors, you can say, that will affect how many ice creams these consumers may wish to buy. But we will assume all of these factors that can affect the amount of ice creams these consumers may wish to buy. We will assume all of these factors to be constant. Because we want to focus on the most important determinant behind how many ice creams consumers may wish to buy. And we assume, to keep things simple, that that is the price of the product itself. The key determinant of how many ice creams these consumers will buy. Now again from the very beginning, remember, we are not saying price is the only thing that will affect these consumers. We are saying all these other things, let us call them non-price factors, the first term that you need to remember. All these things other than price, we are saying yes, we know these are things that can affect these consumers in terms of how much they would want to buy, but we assume these non-price factors to be constant. And then we simply want to build a relationship and see how will the consumers react to different prices in terms of how many ice creams they may wish to buy as prices change. And the simple idea that we want to capture is that assuming you start with certain price of let's say 150 rupees and consumers wish to buy 400 ice creams at that point. 
Now, if everything other than price stays the same, the simple idea is that, look, if the price of ice cream now increases from 150 to 200 and then to 250, as this ice cream becomes more expensive, consumers will buy less than what they were buying at this original price. So as the price increases to 200, let's assume they buy just 200 ice cream and then the price increases further to 250, let's assume consumers buy even less, they just buy 100 ice creams. And similarly, again, assuming we start at 150, if the price starts to fall, let's say first of all to 100. Now, if the price is falling and ice cream is becoming cheaper, then of course consumers will wish to buy more. And let's assume they buy 600 instead of 400 ice cream as the price falls from 150 to 100. And similarly, we can fall the price, decrease the price even further and get another number just using the same logic. Price has fallen, so people would want to buy more ice creams. Now, these simple numbers over here, based on the simple logic where it's universally, you can say, applicable to any product, that is, if the product becomes more expensive, less will be bought and vice versa. The simple logic and the simple numbers based on this logic, this is all the maths you need to understand this model of demand and supply. So you don't need to be afraid of maths. And remember, whenever you see maths and economics, it's there to make life easy. It's there to make sure that you can understand things in a better way. And we will now use these numbers to now understand all of the different terms that we need on the demand side, starting off with demand and quantity demanded, two similar sounding terms, but they are very different from each other. Now, let me start off with demand. Now, usually in everyday casual usage, by demand, we would imply the amount of a good that consumers may wish to buy which may sound like a reasonable definition, but from now on, remember that this definition of demand amount consumers want to buy, it is wrong. Because in this theoretical world of this model of demand and supply, demand is a much, much more important thing than simply amount consumers may wish to buy. Demands give you much more information than that. And the way we formally define demand and what you will think of in terms of demand of a product is that demand is the entire relationship between all the different possible prices and the amount that consumers may wish to buy at each of these different possible prices. This whole thing, all of these numbers over here taken together give you the demand for ice cream. And this, this demand, this relationship between price and what consumers may wish to buy, it assumes all non-price factors are constant. That is, we simply say citrus paribus. So demand, remember, it's yes, it's the amount consumers are willing and able to buy, but at each of the different possible prices. So all of this together, a lot of information constitute one single demand. Whereas, given a demand, at a certain price, the amount consumers may wish to buy is the quantity demanded at this price of 100, whereas this 200 is the quantity demanded at this price of 200. So quantity demanded, remember, it's the junior partner to this more senior demand. And demand, whereas it tells what consumers wish to buy at each of the different possible prices, quantity demanded is the amount consumers wish to buy at a specific price. Now, a good way of remembering that is that a lot of these quantity demanded, these specific quantities at each specific price, a lot of these quantity demanded together constitute this one single whole demand. Now, that are the first two couple of important terminologies, demand and quantity demanded. And once you understand that, we can use this new knowledge to define our and understand our law of demand which is nothing more than a sophisticated way of expressing the simple logic that if a product's price increases, less will be bought and vice versa. Now we say that in a sophisticated economic language by saying that look, given a demand and assuming all non-price factors are constant, law of demand states that if the price increases, quantity demanded falls. And if the price falls, quantity demanded increases. Again, remember, we are assuming citrus paribus, assuming all known price factors are constant. And that then covers all the important terms that you need on the demand side.
And once we know these basic terms, we will use them, put them together to understand the key, central, most important concept of this entire model, which requires you to now understand the difference between the changes in demand versus movement within the same demand. If you can understand this, trust me, this whole model will be your friend, it will be easy and it will work like clockwork difference between changes of demand versus movement in demand. Now the idea involved is again simple. All you need to remember is that look, given a demand and assuming all non-price factors are constant, as long as these non-price factors, everything other than price, if it is constant and it stays constant and the only thing that changes in the market is the price of the product. That is, let's assume that in case of this ice cream market, all things other than price that can affect these consumers let's assume they are constant and then if the price of ice cream increases from 100 to let's say 250 then this demand of ice cream will not change these numbers are still going to tell us demand the only thing that will happen when the price changes from 100 to 250 is that you will move from this combination within this demand to a new combination within this demand so remember that if the only change is the price of the product, then demand stays the same, you move within the same demand to a new point. Whereas if a non-price factor changes, then your whole demand will change. For instance, let's imagine that the city where this market happens to be suffers from an extreme heat wave and the weather gets extremely unusually hot. That is when we are saying that, look, maybe because of this hot weather, not because of price, because of a non-price factor, hot weather, maybe because of that, 20 more people come to this market for ice cream and they want to consume ice cream. Now, these 20 people, when they come to the ice cream, they, when, they and then we look at this demand, then we, this is where we are saying that, look, now at a price of 50, quantity demanded will not be 800, it will be 820. There are 20 new more people who want ice creams because weather is very hot. And even if the price is 150, then you still have these 20 new customers. So this quantity demanded at price of 150, it is not 400 anymore. It is going to be 420. Similarly, if the price is 250, previously the quantity demanded was 100, but now you will have those 20 new customers who are here because they are feeling too hot, not here because of price changes. So these 20 new customers will be in this market regardless of what the price is and therefore all of these previous quantity demanded, they are not going to reflect the true relationship between price and what consumers want to buy. So long story short, it is not that complicated. All you need to remember is anything other than price, which we are just simply saying non-price factor, if that changes and that affects how much consumers may wish to buy, then you will see a change in the entire demand. Whereas if all non-price factors are constant and the only thing to change is the price of ice cream, then the demand will stay the same. You will move within the same demand to a new point. So this is the key difference that you need to remember. Shift versus movement versus in, in, within the same demand. Now, once you know these basics, we can very quickly develop the supply or the producer side. Because again, you see, the, the, we just need to reverse the logic and the concepts that we have used here. So let me just straight away start with the numbers as far as supply is concerned. Now, uh, as far as these producers are uh, you know, part of this market, the reason is that these producers want to make a profit. So if you assume that you know all non-price factors that can affect uh, the, these producers or the profitability of ice cream production, if all these non-price factors are constant and if the only thing that changes is price, then the law of supply tells us that look as far as the producers are concerned, as the prices increase, quantity supplied will also increase. They will want to produce more, whereas if, if price falls, quantity supplied will fall. So that gives you your law of supply. Remember the terminology, price is changing, so we are saying quantity supplied will change. 
now with the same terminology keeping in mind the same basics we can define the supply supply remember is this entire thing over here the entire relationship between all the different possible prices and this time the amount that the producers may wish uh, to supply at each of these different possible prices this entire relationship this entire information taken together is the supply of ice creams and it is assuming all non price factors are constant and lastly quantity supplied remember at a specific price given a supply given this whole thing at a specific price of 50 the quantity supplied the amount producers wish to produce is 400 whereas at a price of 100 the quantity supplied is 300 all of these quantity supplied taken together the junior partners constitute this one whole single supply of this particular product and once we have this demand and supply we can bring them together and understand how this model explains the working of the free market